so let's uh, let's begin. Uh, hi, everyone. People are still uh, dropping in, so that's that's nice to see. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, together with uh, our friend, uh, partner, colleague. I don't know how to call you, Dave, but uh, Dave Snowden is here today. And then we have also my Swedish colleague from Agile 42, Giuseppe De Simone, who is going to keep an, an interview and a discussion with Dave today on the, on the topic complexity-based design thinking. And this is really, really nice. A uh, few small practicalities before I let the guys start. Uh, feel free to use the chat for any kind of comments or uh, I don't know, whatever you want to share with us during the webinar, you can, you can use the chat for this. Uh, and then the Q&A is, is for questions that might pop into your minds during the presentation and the talks. Uh, and the questions will be looked at in the end of the webinar together with both Dave and Giuseppe. So just feel free to pop the questions there. Uh, the session is recorded and we are going to share this recording also online and with you afterwards. So uh, keep an eye on the follow-up email. Mm, yeah, I think that's it from my side. Um, I will stop sharing my screen now and I will pop out for a few minutes when the guys are talking and I'll see you later. Thanks a lot, Fia. Um, and thanks, Dave, for being here today. It's, it's okay. always nice to talk to you and uh, and learn from you. So I will start with the, with maybe you know first generic questions so to let you introduce the subject of today. So what is complexity based design thinking, and how does it differ from a traditional design thinking approach? Um, it's kind of like a both and. It's not an either or. Mm -hmm. So if you look at and it's also to be honest a reflection on the popularization of design thinking by companies like Adeo. So design goes back a long way. I mean, I was working on this, for example, with the architectural school at Arduis over 20 years ago. Yeah. So it's not like design hasn't been a key component of universities. But what happened with what is now known as design thinking is a commoditization, either the production of a linear based approach, the famous double diamond. Yeah? And from our point of view, what that represents is effectively expert ideation, i.e. the expert does the interviews, you know, or the person trained to be an expert, we'll probably come back to that later. So they carry out a set of interviews, they may observe practice, they actually then ideate, they have lots of ideas about it, so you get, it's not ethnography, it's discovery, so you get discovery, then you get ideation, then you get their product, yes, so that's a linear process. So what we've been doing, this is a two year study we've been working on with a whole bunch of academics and also practitioners. Uh, three retreats, one in Australia, one in Canada and one in the United Kingdom. Yeah, over two years. Um, and we've, what we've ended up with is, is two main components. One is um, to go beyond expert ideation and expert discovery to add in distributed discovery and distributed ideation. So what that allows us to do is to map an articulated needs, yeah, as well as to do mass engagement um, in coming up with ideas. And then finally, we get this concept of acceptation, which comes from biology, otherwise known as radical, radical repurposing, yeah, in which, in effect, you find novel uses for things you're already competent about. Now, that actually is one of the big things here, particularly, for example, in the crisis we're in at the moment. The ability to redeploy existing knowledge for a radical purpose is going to be key. So that ability to say, OK, we've got a two by two matrix now. We've got, you know, expert idea, expert discovery, expert ideation, you know, bottom left. Yeah, we, then, we can then go distributed discovery, expert ideation. So we do mass capture, we understand unarticulated needs, but we present that to experts. Or we can do expert discovery, distributed ideation. We present a problem to thousands or hundreds of people to get their results. And then finally, we start to match, and this is the ultimate, we start to match existing capability against unarticulated needs. So that's element number one. Element number two is the concept of scaffolding. And this has been the big missing link in complexity theory, because we know in complexity, in organizations that is, yeah, you can, there's a desire to determine what sort of goal you want to achieve to design something. 
And that's always been a problem for complexity because in complexity, we start journeys, we don't try and achieve goals. So the concept of scaffolding emerged from those retreats and there are various types of scaffolding, which means basically you put a scaffold in place, you define interactions around the scaffold and you see what emerges. So it allows you to put enough structure in place that there can be an evolutionary process, but not so much that you over constrain it. So those are the two main elements. Can't hear you. Sorry, Giuseppe, you're on mute. Yeah, okay. No, sorry. Uh, I said I heard you saying many times uh, in, in the coming weeks and months about like uh, one of the most critical ways to exit a crisis is to start now to repurpose this existing capability yeah. to match an articulated needs. So I would like you to elaborate a little bit more about that, that part that, that always is like, a, as okay. a, in a way, intrigued me. So I think there, there are two or three things you need to do as, as a matter of some priority, right? First of all, you may have a crisis management team and process, but you need to create three other teams. Yeah, a learning team, an innovation team, and an unintended consequences team. And these need to be set up straight away because the learning that comes after the crisis is going to be retrospective. So it will be determined by politics. So what you actually need is the evidence of what people are doing in the here and now. So, for example, one of the things we're launching with the UNDP um, later on today when I finish off the blog post um, is a, an experiment over two weeks to allow leaders to journal how they feel at the start and end of each day, but then to capture missed opportunities, lessons learned, ideas for innovation throughout the day. And that's designed to create an initial database. Yeah. Um, which will then go in for funding and validation and all those are the good things. But the basic concept, is, and we're doing this at the moment, for example, with the Welsh Audit Office. So they're rolling out our journaling software to every auditor across Wales to act as forensic observers from the present. And we're saying you should do the same in companies. Yeah, You should use your leaders, your middle managers, your employees, even if they're working from home, to create continuous observational data of what they're learning, what they've seen, missed opportunities, ideas for innovation, because then you can start to look for patterns in that. The second thing is the innovation team, um, and they need to be focused effectively on this concept of radical repurposing. So how do we actually find things that we can do very quickly? And that's also the ad hoc group. It, it's, yeah, it's kind of like we can do good enough in a crisis. Yeah? We don't have to do perfect. So what is there that with a little bit of tinkering could be used for something completely different? And there's a whole body of examples on that. I won't use COVID ones at the moment, but for example, in the Thailand floods, um, they realized that all their cars were going to get saturated when the flood water came through. So a whole bunch were near a factory which had these massive plastic bags for furniture. So they drove their cars into plastic bags, sealed the end, yeah, left them in the garage and their cars were perfectly all right at the end of it. So that's an example of radical repurposing. Yeah? You find something in the pressure, you do it. Then the third team is the unintended consequences team. Because the one thing we know with absolute certainty about a complex adaptive system is that whatever you do will have unintended consequences. Now, the good news is most of them will be beneficial if you can spot them early enough. And some of them will be negative. So you need to both model them, simulate them, red team them, whatever you want to talk about it. But then as they come, you want people dedicated to seeing how they can be exploited. Yeah, either to create a pathway we don't want to tread because negative stories have power, or to actually find completely novel ways out of the process. And you can't do that with your crisis team because they're focused on managing the constraint structure. And the final point I'll make then, and this isn't relevant to design, but it just feeds off that, in a crisis, you coordinate centrally, but you distribute decision making. Uh, and that's critical because the center has to coordinate, it hasn't got time to make decisions. And that's part of that process. Yeah. <clears throat> now, th this, this is um, like seems a, a paradox, right? Uh, and it, it, actually, it's, it's uh, challenging the way traditional organization in government have been working so far. Like you have an emergency normally, you handle the emergency, and then when the emergency is over, then you try to learn from the emergency. So, uh, like, and I understand that having these multiple teams is a way to handle this paradox, but what else 
would you suggest to, to solve this similar problem? Work for people. I mean, I, we, did, we did a whole bunch of work on 9-11, all right, post 9-11. Yeah. Um, and it was fascinating because when the congressional report on 9-11 came out, which was entirely retrospective, yeah? yeah. So somebody had spotted that people were being trained to take off and fly but not land. So after 9-11, that's usually significant. But everybody forgets it was ones of millions of weak signals coming in. So how do you know that one's significant at the time? You don't. Right? Yeah. But at the same time, the second shuttle disaster report came out in the same week. And the first shuttle disaster report said we didn't have the right information in front of the right people. It was a retrospective report. The second shuttle disaster report said we had all the, we did all that, but people didn't pay attention. And I mean, I'm going on the hill on this in DC. All right, we couldn't get people to listen. You're making the same mistake. You're thinking this is an information management program. I think the other big problem you've got is that hindsight is a terrible thing. The way you remember things if you succeed is different from the way you remember the things if you fail. So for people in the Scrum community, we're currently doing the first experiments on real-time retrospectives. So rather than wait for a period and then do a retrospective, we're kind of like you know the current state, so you're going to revise your view of the history. We actually capture the retrospective in real time in a distributed way and then present it yeah, when you come to that. So the real time thing is key. Yeah, you, you can't yeah. afford to be retrospective. No, it makes a lot of sense and that and the retrospective coherence is actually uh, a huge trap uh, especially when working with with complex system but still i feel this is a, might be a challenge and this is definitely a challenge for government and for organization so what else would you recommend uh, to, um, to 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 handle this uh, this both like handling emergency but looking thinking about the future now already by keeping in separate teams yeah right? and the other point is, I and mean, there's a famous speech that Lincoln gives to the Congress, I think in 1890 something. And he says, as the times are in you, and this is during the Civil War, we need to think in you, we need to act in you. You've never got a better chance to get people to behave differently than you have during a crisis. Yeah? Uh, if you wait till after the crisis, people will go back to the old norm. So we're seeing decisions being made in government and in industry far faster than ever been before. They're being made ad hoc. They're taking real experimental ideas because they know the old ways don't work. I mean, just at a very trivial level. We organized a webinar the other day on, you know, where I brought three heavyweight academics on complexity together in what was a very academic webinar. Yeah. Um, 2,000 people registered. Yeah, that was done with Agile 42 in Canada with Dave. Yeah. Um, so 2,000 people registered, 1,300 turn up. We, I think we've had three or 4,000 downloads, right? Um, McKinsey's organized a series of events with some of the systems thinking guys, like the people who dominated the last 30 years, two or 300, even with bigger maidenness. And I think people know that the old solutions are not sufficient under the current problems. Yeah? So for those of you being champions of complexity, kind of like it sees the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned some of the, the tools that you are uh, yeah. designing about uh, you know and that will make this complexity design thinking approach um, what what are the tools can you mention that that you you did not so far well, we're doing several I mean some are method based mm -hmm. um, we've been using trios an awful lot both for distributed decision making and also for discovery so I'll give you two examples of that um, we know that it's difficult for a systems analyst to go and interview users and get objective data back because we biologically we've evolved to see what we expect to see we don't see the unexpected the other problem is that users have no idea what technology can do for them and they've got some idea yeah you know, but they don't know what to ask for in a sense we're kind of like partly reversing that bit of the agile manifesto which said you should put users first yeah, the reality is, and I've known this in all my years in IT, which is um, over 40 now, right? Um, is fundamentally users don't know what they want until they get it, and then they want something different. Because you give them a new system, they realize what maybe they should have asked for. Yeah? And just reducing it to a backlog is, has another whole set of problems to go with that. So one of the things we do, for example, there is we deploy three people um, a user trained to talk to IT people, 
um, that's easier than the other way around. A young and experienced programmer who is just very bright and very fast, and somebody who sees the system as a whole, say a systems architect or actually a tester. Testers often have a better view of the overall system than the designers. Yeah? So experience, inexperienced user, and you might deploy 15 trios to look at a problem and build prototypes. Now that gives you distributed discovery. You're not allowing a limited discovery. You're not running it in workshops, which get biased by the facilitator very quickly. You're not writing story points. You're not doing epics. What you're actually doing is parallel experiments with a cognitively diverse team. So that's an example of a design methodology for discovery. Uh, we also are using trios for distributed decision making at the moment because you can't trust people in a crisis. You just have to realize that. Um, it's been quite interesting and within the Cognitive Edge network is finding who will cooperate and who won't when the chips are down. You know, I can think of a couple of people who I thought were sent to core and central who were all of a sudden just grabbing stuff and trying to sell it for themselves rather than contribute to the whole. So in a crisis, people change their behavior. So you have to build trust into the process. So to give you the medical example we've got, you can actually say any doctor with a over five years experience can make any abnormal triage decision that's outside the formal guidelines because it's ambiguous provided it's signed off by say a nurse with 10 years experience and somebody in admin they, they don't work with on a daily basis so what i've done is i've created a process by which decisions can literally be made very quickly but they force limited localized transparency which allows for innovation and novelty and it validates the process so that would be another type of example of distributed decision making on the software side the journals that's where they come in so people are continuously capturing problems i've got ideas i've got opportunities i've missed things i've heard about and then we look for statistically valid patterns in those narratives and we present those clusters of narratives say to a designer or a coder so what we don't do is have any interpretation of that into backlog. We give the programmers direct access to the frustrated stories of the users without any mediation yeah, in terms of statistical patterns. So that's another example of a tool for, for discovery. On ideation, that's where we present a problem to thousands of people or hundreds of people or tens of people, whatever we need. We get them all to interpret it in real time. And this is done with high abstraction metadata. So they don't know what the right answer is. It's deliberately ambiguous. And from that, we draw fitness landscapes, which look like contour maps with different colors. And we're looking for there several things. One is commonality and difference. But the other thing we're really interested in is what I call finding the 17%. And this comes from famous experiments run with radiologists in which they were shown pictures, uh, basically given a batch of x-rays and asked to discover anomalies. On the final x-ray, there was a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. 83% didn't see it, even though their eyes scan it. And the 17% who did see it came to believe they were wrong with, when they talked with the 83%. So the key thing you do on this is you present it real time, no conversation, this is the wisdom of crowds idea, abstract concepts, abstract pictures, but you find the clusters of people who are thinking differently and you go and talk with them. So those would be two examples of tools. On the acceptation side, um, this goes back 30 years to my original work in knowledge management. We're using diary-based decision journals to continuously map what the organization knows or mass capture for fast capture. And then we're matching that with user needs at this ambiguous level. So we're throwing things together at a high level of ambiguity and presenting in clusters of why is this knowledge base linked with this user need so that you can look at it and that's what we call managing for serendipity. So favorite example on this. I'm um, in 1945, a Raytheon engineer maintaining the magnet of a radar machine spotted that a chocolate bar melted in his pocket and realized the significance. And from that, we get microwave ovens. Now, lots of people actually spotted chocolate bars melting in their pocket, but didn't realize the significance. So what we do in what's called managed acceptation or managed serendipity is to say, why are these things together? So we ask a question so that people pay attention. 
So those are kind of like the tools and the methods. I mean, there's others, but those are kind of like the highlights that we've been working on the last two years. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this adds a little bit more uh, content than to, to, the, to the approach. Um, I, I mean, going back to the, to the emergency of these peers, I mean, I know that we have been doing already a lot of work with the United Nations and both sense making projects and other uh, stuff with government and companies. We've also been, uh, as you know, like uh, uh, running now a, a sense maker project with understanding the response from the, the, the organization, how they uh, like, how much resilience they get to that. But given your, your project so far, your analysis and your conversation, what, what is the most interesting highlight you got in the last weeks or the most surprising things that you got from this? We haven't yet got enough data to form statistically valid conclusions. The most surprising thing for me has been the willingness of people to journal. We actually thought that would be difficult. Yeah? But what we've actually found is in a crisis, people want peer-to-peer peer -to -peer narrative flow. So a surgeon dealing with ethically problematic decisions on triage, for example, I keep coming back to that because it's one of the current projects, yeah? wants to hear other stories of other people in similar situations. They don't want that distilled into a best practice document or a flow chart. They want to hear other people's voice. And because we allow them to do that, they're prepared to put their own voices in. So we originally developed this ironically with the US Army in Afghanistan by getting company commanders to capture stories in the field in return for not writing a patrol report. But that peer-to-peer -peer flow of narrative is actually key. And I remember it was, um, I was thrown out of the Pentagon. Well, I wasn't thrown out, but I was asked to go and they've got guns and things, so I left voluntarily. For basically saying the Army Lessons Learned program, which was narrative-based, was a waste of time because they were capturing narrative in the field and then they were distilling it into doctrine back in Tradoc, which is kind of like what everybody in IT does. They talk to users, they distill it into something they think is concrete. Yeah? Now, actually, it was interesting, General Sorensen, who was there at the original thing, and now when this happened, was three-star in charge of IT for the US Army, phoned me up to say, come back in, you were right. Because this was at the time of the Iraq war, and the only thing which worked was between commanders blogging. People wanted peer-to-peer -peer flow of narrative. They didn't want doctrine developed or somebody else's synthesis, right? So that, that's kind of like a key concept. Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting because we're human beings and we're all surprised that we want to be recognized and uh, have our voice heard. Yeah, that's, that's I'm it. looking at the picture behind you, all right? I mean, yeah. the other basically thing is, you know, visions and goals are probably a mistake in a crisis. Yeah. yeah well, you, you need to navigate the stormy present, yeah? To quote yeah. Lincoln again. Yeah, no, but that's, that's great. But I mean, one, one question, what do you think that, you know, organizations, but also the society will, will learn after this crisis, or at least what they will rediscover uh, somehow. Oh, you're talking about broad stuff and I'm spending too many times in think tanks on this at the moment. I think I, I, I said on one, all right, that this is kind of like God's gift to the humanity. It's a chance to get it right. Yeah. Because this is nothing like as bad as what is coming. Right? I mean, we've, I mean the, Alicia Gerardo in the seminar called, called this um, a black elephant. Mm. It's yeah. not a black swan because we knew it was coming. We, we, it was the elephant in the room we chose to ignore. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, in the UK, there was a complete simula simulation exercise run on the basis of a flu pandemic, which basically identified 80% of what we're now learning, but was completely ignored in terms of supply because the money was needed elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, kind of like we've got this rather weird position at the moment. And if you look at the big, the big things coming out of this, one is we suddenly discovered money isn't a rationing device. So we've been told for years that there ain't enough money. I mean, the famous British Prime Minister said there isn't a magic money tree. Well, yeah, now there are magic money forests growing in every country all over the world because it's not a constraint. So starting to rethink whether money is the right rationing device for social services is now an open question. Yeah, the, the move on minimum wage, um, the work we've been doing on gifting. So gifting in Aboriginal communities is an entry price to be allowed access to services. So I'll give you a practical example on that. I proposed, but didn't get accepted by a political party in the UK, that our 
policy for the election should be to announce national service. We got rid of that in the UK in the 50s. Yeah? And national service can be going into the armed services, but it can also be working overseas for two years in a development project. If you do that, and it's voluntary, then the state pays for your education. If you don't do it, you pay commercial prices for your education. Now, what I'm doing is it's not an equal exchange, but it's the gift exchange. You gift your time, you show you care about other people, other people will therefore gift you an education. Okay? Now, I think those sort of concepts are going to start to come through more and more as we start to think about this. And some of the stuff we're now doing is to say, we need to look at doing this in the here and now. We can't wait for the end. Yeah? The trouble is you've got major countries. So Germany is probably going to have to go into lockdown again because they're getting a second wave. Last time I checked, there were 16 mutations on COVID. So it's mutating faster than anything we've seen before. German, uh, the US seems to be adopting a policy by which it doesn't mind sacrificing a significant number of its population, provided the economy keeps going which means people are going to stop traveling to Germany. Um, everybody's trying to blame the WHO and China, which is nonsensical, but it's a classic populist response. So I think you're going to see states align themselves more to China and less to America. They're going to hedge their bets. Yeah. So I think the economic structures in which we work will also go to more localized supply. So I think a lot of things are going to change. The one thing which won't happen is that all work won't go virtual. We'll use it more, but it won't be exclusive no. because the we're now seeing major mental illness as a result of people spending too much time on Zoom. Yeah. And there's actually a reason for this, by the way. Yeah, if, if you do, I mean, I'm doing a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of them I'm doing without video. Or like now, I'm not looking at you, I'm actually looking at the garden. Um, if you just hear a voice, then you know, we've had three or four generations of telephones and radio, but when we see people. Yeah, we're used to chemical stimulation as well as visual stimulation, and we're not getting it. So we get very confused. And things like trust validation, which is pheromone based, we can no longer do. So there is a stress based issue on this. So I think we're going to see new forms of working, but it won't be a, a pendulum shift. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I, was, I was at that webinar and I was really interested in this concept of, of a black elephant. And I really hope that organizations also will learn to deal with this because it's so many times that people are ignoring things that are there. Everybody knows it's there, but, uh, but we ignore. And then when it, it pops up, then everybody's surprised, right? So, so it's, it well, would be great I, if we learn how to deal with this. I think that, but I, mean, I think it's also shown that the failures. I mean, it's interesting. My, my next webinar after this, which is literally a follow-up, is to talk to the Stoic Society of North America on resilience. Yeah. Um, and I've always been a cynic, not a stoic, so it's going to get interesting, right? Because there's a long-term battle on that in philosophy. But um, I think people are starting to realise, for example, the supply chain at the moment, the problem isn't necessarily there isn't enough food, but the supply chain is, is badly stressed. Because we only, in the UK, I think we only had about two days of supply in the, in the food chain, whereas go back 30 years, we had two weeks. Yeah? So the whole just-in-time concept yeah, has radically reduced resilience. So if something gets stressed, everything breaks. You've also had the whole business process re-engineering Six Sigma approach, which has eliminated what they say is waste, but actually created resilience. You need variety and surplus capacity. Yeah? And you also need interacting systems, not overwhelming colossi. So in, in Agile, um, safe is the worst possible thing to have around in a crisis like this. Yeah, because it's overstructured, over bureaucratic. What you want is rapid assembly of different methods which can interact with each other in real time. You can't afford these highly structured methods. You know, we have business process re-engineering, we have Six Sigma, we then have SAFE. Yeah, the, the idea that you, you can solve all your problems by creating an engineering diagram and making people fit in it is basically yeah. the wrong metaphor. And that's damage resilience in society and industry alike. Yeah, you, 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 you know we know that, right? And we, we are like now promoting this uh, idea of, of uh, using a, an organic metaphor for organization and hopefully that we will learn not to over constrain complex system too much and to avoid the chaos in the future. But I mean, one, what is one thing that unfortunately companies still will not get after this 
crisis? Is there one thing that you, you're realizing that, unfortunately, you know, it's very no, hard it will, to get? It will vary by region and nation. I mean, and it will also depend on national experience. So Britain looks set to have more deaths than the rest of Europe put together. Right? That's going to have a profound effect on how we see ourselves as a nation. Sweden may start to rival us because they've taken, they've made the same mistake that Britain made. Yeah. Uh, there's strong rumours at the moment the only reason we went down for lockdown is the French president said he would close the channel ports if we didn't. Yeah. Because it looks at the moment like the British policy is dri driven by behavioural ep economists, not by epidemiologists. Now that seems to be switching, yeah, but it is a problem. Because behavioural ec ec economists think in large numbers. And then you've got the sort of nonsense of people like Taleb who are saying, I'm the only one who understands it because I understand mathematical modeling, right? Um, I've got articles from epidemiologists screaming about this, that just because you're a bright kid with some statistical packages doesn't mean you know enough about epidemiology to build the models in the first place, right? But this big data myth is actually also really scary. So I think the danger is that companies will not see through that fast enough. And what they won't do is they won't use the intelligence of the humans. One of the big things we're recommending them, I'm writing this handbook on crisis and complexity management, which will hopefully be out this week, is that you need to actually communicate by engagement. So you need to engage your employees as a distributed workforce in saying what's going on and coming up with ideas. And for them to discover messages in that, in that in exchange, rather than just being seen as passive recipients of communication from the top. So I think the organizations who put that in place, and that's really easy to do, you know, we've got all of that sort of stuff set up, will be the ones who find novel ways out of the crisis. And provided they put the organizational changes in place now, during the crisis, those will stay in place afterwards. If they wait till afterwards, they'll just go back to the norm. Yeah. So I will ask you the, my final question, then we'll leave to some question from the, the audience, because I, I, I feel, I know that um, there are a lot of questions. Um, so going back to the, to the complexity-based design thing, I mean, what, what would you suggest to people who want to learn more about that? And what would you recommend? Well, we, we kind of like learned the hard way. We did the first course on it last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we thought, oh, well, we can't do, we were going to do a two-day course in Brussels. So we thought, well, we'll make it four half days. And then Jay Bloom and I suddenly realized, because both of us can go academic quite easily, um, but we weren't getting the feedback. We, we've done this before, right? And you, you can see what the audience can take and what they can't take. So you adjust what you're saying. A virtual environment you just can't do that. Yeah. I mean, we got satisfaction and only one person left. So I'm quite pleased about that. Um, we're now actually converting that. So we're putting all of our course material is going asynchronous, not synchronous. And every, every lecture is going to be a, a briefer lecture, but with other experts asking the lecturer questions and the, and the meeting being recorded. So we're going to punch those out. You watch those. Everything is done synchronously. So we will have that course up and selling again in about two weeks time. Yeah? So that trains people to use the user software. But there's other things you can do. So Anne Pendleton Julian, who did a lot of the work with us, has written a brilliant set of books with John C. D. Brown called Design Unbound. Go and read those. Yeah, they tell you a huge amount. The other thing is go and look at any book on design from a university. Um, the guys who put together design thinking didn't bother with any of that. They just threw together an industrialized linear method. Yeah, it works in product creation if you've got good creatives in it, but it doesn't work on a scalable basis. So go back to the, the origins of design before Roger came along and codified it. Go back and read that sort of material or, or the new material coming out, as I say, from, from Anne and others. Yeah, and that will give you a lot of the background. Yeah, thanks a lot. And we really hope we can have you in Stockholm in, in, in fall as we discussed, because people are it still... It was uh, planned, all right? Um, yeah. So, so people are still uh, thanking us for the event last year with, uh, with Simon, but uh, so we hope that this year we can have uh, this design thinking uh, course in, in Stockholm. So 
uh, I thank you uh, for the moment. I leave to to Fia so that she can probably read and ask you some of the questions from from the audience. Um, the like the stage is yours, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you also from my side, Dave. There's a few questions that have come in and I think people are still going to ask some more. Uh, one is, is about the books that you just suggested now. We, we would like to send out a follow-up email, so maybe we can add the, the titles in there as well. Maybe you can share it with us. Uh, after. Yeah, there's some others that Jade has got, so we can send you a reading list on that. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Um, uh, so let's just go through the questions so far that we have. Uh, there is a guy saying that he finds Kenevin an astonishing framework. And with that said, uh, he sees that Kenevin is used and embedded in many topics, uh, but he doesn't see any certified courses in, in Italy to attend. And uh, now I don't know no, about... Any certified <laughs> courses anywhere which we endorse. Yeah, okay. I mean, you need to be certified if you believe in certification on things like this, all right? Um, no, I mean, I think this is a real problem within Agile that's getting driven insane by certification schemes and update, you know, paying a hundred dollars for an update if you just read a slide set that Dean put together last mm. night at home, more variations on that theme, right? Um, we have a foundations course online, um, which has just been rebadged and put up again, you can do that. Um, various people use Kinevin in their various courses, you know, Liz Keo and the like does that within the Agile community. We actually own the trademark, which we actually took possession of, but that was defensive, not aggressive. We were hearing rumors that some people were going to try and trademark it. So rather like the people who made the men, the people who made money out of penicillin were the Americans who patented it rather than the British who said it should be free. So we, we put that on as a base restriction, but we don't control or stop people using it. People do what they do. If they produce a four domain frame, four quadrant matrix, then I tend to knock them a bit if they don't get corrected. But there's plenty of training available, there's plenty mm. of experience. You know? um, there's also the advanced courses which are going online, which dive into more detail on that. Those we're finishing off at the moment, those will be the async synchronous type combination. But we don't let people on that unless they've done our foundations course. Yeah, so that's kind of like a route. So we're more about creating a community. If you need a certificate of attendance, I'll happily print you off one and sign it. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that if that's what you need to keep people happy, yeah? Okay. But competence comes by practice. The one area where we are gonna certify people is in the design thinking tools. Mm -hmm. Because we can then give you a project and get you to set up the tools and test whether you could do it properly. Yes, yeah, so there I can actually measure whether you know what you know. It's not just a multi-choice question or something like that. Okay, okay, thank you. Also, uh, as we mentioned the organic agility a little bit in this webinar, we also use uh, Kinevin and we speak about complexity and organizational designs and, and stuff like that in those courses. And these links will also be in the, in the email afterwards. And maybe we can also link to your training state that you just mentioned so that people get this. Um, then there's another question. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, you're going back. I, I started in software design in logistics. Uh, that's where I started, all right? And I still have a passion for it, working with Cranfield. Um, I think uh, one of the big things we did, and this was back in the 80s, we did the first ever scientific approach to managing spares or buffer stock. Yeah? Because up until that time, people had a two bin approach. Now I know this because I've got three wine fridges and I have a, a three bin approach. So the minute one wine fridge is empty, I reorder. Right? It's a nice simple mechanism, all right? Move things around, I know where I'm going. But there's a huge amount of waste involved in that. So what we actually did, and this, this was a product called Merco, um, first software product I ever built, yeah? And one of the three I've done now over the years in startup. And um, what we actually did is we actually looked at, we allocated different forecasting algorithms to different demand types, and then we looked at forecast accuracy. Then we dynamically adjusted buffer stock based on forecast accuracy over time. So, and we also did a huge amount of work on fresh. Now, that work still stands, but it was rather eliminated by process re-engineering, which tried to eliminate buffer stock. We actually said buffer stock is key. Right, so I think we need to go back to some of that stuff and start to increase the buffering, right, within the system. 
I think we're also supply chains are going to be more localized um, because having extended supply chains based on easy access shipping an aircraft say from China that doesn't apply that's now a high-risk strategy uh, we're seeing food go more local as well yeah and and that's at various levels not only the big supermarkets but I mean when I go out on the bike when we're still allowed out on the bike all right technically for an hour but I'm managing two hours because less than 50 kilometers i don't want to put on the lycra yeah this is kind of my, my life these days is pajamas lycra bath pajamas gin and tonic bed all right i mean that's the way it works when you're working at home but i mean uh, as my standard 50 kilometer ride there are far, five farms now which basically offer milk and eggs and things at the gate on a honesty basis so people start these local supplies yeah so I think we're going to see um, more geographical localization. So tighter geographies, extended time, yeah, more resilience in the systems, and and more ability to handle substitutes. We may also see a change in shopping patterns. It's it's actually quite interesting. Um, I, and I got a waitress because my wife isn't allowed out of the house. She won't be allowed out until next year, which mm -hmm. gives me a major problem if I have to go to the states or anything. Right, so probably can't for a bit. Um, so I have to do the shopping, which is fine. I like doing it. Um, I have to go and stand two meters apart in a long queue outside Waitrose. Um, normally 10, 15 minutes. And I can have conversations with people I don't know because I've got people two meters ahead and two meters behind and we've got nothing to do. So we chat and that's actually quite fun. And I go into the store and there's only 50 people in it. So I can get around fast and do what I want to do and mm. come out. And actually, I'm quite enjoying this. It's kind of like, could we carry on with this permanently, please? All right. Um, <laughs> I'm just missing the bookshop, right? The bookshop. I mean, I never used Amazon. I always send my orders to the local bookshop. And when I go in there, we, we swap notes and stuff like that. So I think we're going to see some changes in shopping habits and shopping patterns. I don't think it will be as much online as people think. I think there's still a need for physicality in some of this work in terms of, of work like that. Um, but the big changes in the supply chain are, you know, tighter geography, increased time, I think. Yeah, um, yeah Hend Hendrix raised an important point. I mean, the, the problem is what we've actually got. And, and I, I'm starting to think this attack on WHO is coordinated. Um, because it's happening through the same sort of right-wing propagandists we've seen before. Um, the reality is that experts will get things wrong, and the trouble is they then correct, and then people said, oh, so you'll be wrong this time, and therefore my half-baked algorithm is as good as your expertise. So we're not managing the, the, the expertise in the trust, and, we're not, and people aren't trained to interpret graphs either. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry has been doing this for years. They've been getting drugs through compliance by just playing with the statistics. Um, so there's no way that if you're not a statistician, you can really understand a whole bunch of graphs. So stop trying. It's more about deciding who you trust and how those, into, how those interpret those. Yeah. Uh, limits and constraints. Now, there's a huge difference. It's, it's, I would say it was a good question, but I learned not to do that in Australia. Where you know, the chief executive turned to me and said, I didn't ask you to rate my question, you pommy bastard, I asked you to answer it, right? Um, the whole point about constraints is constraints can enable or they can govern. So, or they can contain or they can link. Yeah, so the, yeah, they can be internal, they can be external, they can be endo or exoskeletons. Without constraints, evolution doesn't happen. There can be no progress. The issue is what type of constraints you want. So a limit is just one limited type of constraint. Yeah. Um, there's a much more, and one of the big things we got in the crisis management handbook is the first thing you do is map the constraints and identify which you can control and which you can change. Because everything else is a waste of time. Yeah. Um, if well, I mean, uh, to this formal course in design thinking, uh, my cousins son right very bright kid yeah kelly he did a, a undergraduate degree in archaeology at oxford over four years and got a first class honors um he then went to harvard and did his, his phd masters over three years and again got distinction and did five years as an apprentice in an architectural firm and now he can call himself an architect that's called professionalism he didn't go on a two-week 
two day course, you know, complete an open book exam over the next five weeks and called himself a master of architecture. All right? So if you want to be a design professional, it's kind of like a career. If you want to use design tools in an organization, well, yes, there are courses for that. Yeah. But you know, the design professionals are the people who devote their life to it. Yeah? You can use the tools. Mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, Roberta has a question now. Uh, Roberta, I'm, I'm not an economist, all right? Um, but I think the political backwash from the number of deaths we're going to have is going to have a major impact. Um, we've also got a social services system which was designed to prevent people claiming. So it was designed to effectively make it so difficult to claim social services that you would probably go away and do something else instead. And you can't repurpose that to handle the sort of crisis we got. I mean, we're, people are running out of money at the moment and that worries a lot of us. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And there isn't the mechanism in place. The sort of charity-based food kitchens aren't gonna happen. So you're gonna get massive disruption on that. Right? Um, the finance sector in Britain is probably sound, but if you look at it, British Airways, London, you know, a huge amount of Britain was based on the, the centrality of Heathrow. British Airways have just laid off half their staff. Yeah, these sort of things are going to take a long time to recover. Germany, which has always worked more on localised industry and small firms, that's actually more resilient than a few big multinationals. Yeah. Um, You've also got more coherence in parts of Central Europe between the state and industry and the population uh, than you've got, say, in the UK and the US. And what the hell Sweden is doing, I don't know, right? I, mean, I did not expect Sweden to go down the route of herd immunity. That was a real shock. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're gonna pay for that. So, I, I, and the answer is we kind of like don't know, right? Um, and I've yet to see an economist who ever got things right in advance of a crisis. So I don't see any economists getting things in the right advance at the end of a crisis. They're very good at retrospectives. Um, one of the things we're recommending is that if, if you, when you hit a crisis, if it's a genuine crisis you haven't planned for, then what you actually need to do is very quickly break your teams into groups of 5, 15 or 150, dependent on the function with overlapping membership so that the teams can assemble and reassemble in different combinations in real time. And that's kind of like a whole process that's fairly easy to do. Yeah, and those teams, but you have to enable them with peer-to-peer -peer learning systems. Yeah, um, and it's interesting, if you combine peer-to-peer -peer knowledge flow with centralized visibility and coordination, you can actually get a lot out of it. The minute you try and flow knowledge distribution through the center, it all breaks down. But the agile belief that everybody can spontaneously self-organize and everybody should be trusted to make the right decision is also total crap. Yeah, in a crisis, you can't do that. You've got to take different approaches. Yeah. Um, cultural scene, God only knows, right? I mean, yeah, the things I enjoy doing are climbing on the hills, going to the opera and watching rugby, right? So two of those have just got hit. You know, I've had two Wagner ring cycles cancelled on me already and I'm worried about the next one, yeah. Um, I think this is a real issue, right? Because I actually think human beings didn't evolve to live in social isolation. By the way, it's physical isolation. It's not necessarily social isolation. We're, we're talking mm -hmm. about terms there. Um, I think it's far too easy to say. I mean, there's some innovation going on. So the English National Opera have actually repurposed the old drive-in cinema. So they're organizing drive-in opera. So you drive in in your car. Yeah, into the alley pally and you watch the opera on the big stage you know with headphones and everything but you're socially isolated so we'll see those sort of innovations going on but it won't be the same thing football behind closed doors without crowds it just doesn't have the same feel about it mm. i mean i go to the opera i don't really watch opera on dvds i'll listen to it in background but the physical experience of being there is radically different mm. um, and Cardiff Blues always do better when I am there because I can use force of will from the terraces to actually make a difference, right? I mean, this is the way these things work, yeah? So we don't know. And I, I think I, I would be very seriously worried if anybody gave you definitive answers to the economics argument or any of the answers. We can probably tell you things which won't happen. 
but nobody knows what will. Yeah, and you need to design again for openness on that. So I hear you. Um, yes, if you're interested in that, there are actually um, specific groups. There's that, we're actually convening a coaching group at the moment, which includes um, a firm in New Zealand who used Kinevin extensively, Jennifer Garvey Berger there, who's written on Kinevin. Um, Hannah Sanan in Germany, um, Sonia's managing that. So there is a coaching coaching movement building around Kinevin with associated software tools. So if you want to know about that, Sonia's the person to talk. She's our, our CEO. Yeah. I tend to work more on systems. She tends to work more on people. Yeah. I, I think she's wrong, but in a nice way, and she thinks I'm wrong, but in a nice way. So that's cool, right? Um, so that's that one. Yeah, decision mapping and constraints, you can do the both simultaneously, particularly if you do them in a distributed way, right? Because you can actually see evidence of constraints in the decisions that people make. Yeah, but you, you can specifically look for that. Yeah. Um, the downside of Sweden's strategy is you're taking a herd immunity strategy. And the herd immunity strategy assumes that if you get infected, you can't get infected twice. And we think that may not be the case. Yeah, so, and also, how many of your old people do you want to die? Or how many of your young people who are vulnerable do you want to die? This thing is mutating fast. Yeah, it's, and we, we don't know, it hasn't got a single vector of death. It's got multiple vectors by which it kills people. Yeah, we've got a new variation for vulnerable young children at the moment. We just don't know on this. So Sweden and Britain and America have taken a very, very high risk strategy. If it pays off, they can all claim it, but it is bloody high risk. I, I, you know, one of my key researchers is in Germany at the moment, and we've all said, just stay there. Mm. Yeah, people went back to Hong Kong because it's safer than Britain. Mm. And the minute you get people who put the economy over people's lives, panic. Mm. I think there's one question left, and uh, we can take this, and then we will probably need to wrap up a little bit because Thanks, time yeah. is running short. <clears throat> Um, we're, I'm actually writing this at the moment, all right? It goes under three headings. It's kind of like assess, adapt, exact, transcend. So that booklet will be published, you know, very soon, yeah? So it depends on what stage you're coming in, but it's a, it, we've written this really simply with a design team. It's four major stages. Each of the four major stages has five actions and so on, yeah? So we've made it fairly simple. Because to be honest, in a crisis, you tend to follow a recipe, yeah? and then see what comes out to that. Yeah. So we're, we're going to publish on that shortly. And I also encourage you to have a look at organic agility because you know that's also part of, of this we have developed together with, with Dave. So I think Fia has some suggestion or some... Yeah, yeah. Wrapping up or... Yeah, uh, in the wrap up, I can say that we are going to send out... Uh, this is an... powered by SenseMaker project. project. Yes, yeah. yes that we will send out the links also, if you are interested in attending the organic agility trainings, they will be also in the email. Mm, we also mentioned here that we might have a training on this topic uh, in September with Dave, uh, actually in Stockholm, if we are allowed to do this. So we are keeping our fingers crossed and we will also keep you posted on this when we have the details and the dates and everything set. So if you found this session interesting, I will assure you that you will also like the date uh, in person with us. So there's also webinars coming up on organic agility. Uh, I will send also info for, for this uh, in the email to you. Um, and if something is missing or you feel something was left out from this uh, follow up, just let us know and we will uh, also contact Dave to get, get what he wants so, or what you need from him. So that will be uh, fixed. I think that was it. We had a lot of cool questions and it was nice, Dave, that you joined us today. It was really, really nice to see you and see okay. that you're well and uh, listen to this interesting discussion between you and Giuseppe. It was very, very nice. Thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, I, recently, I recently tweeted that, you know, every time I spoke to you, even if I, I heard these things many times, I always learned something different. And that was true today as well. So thank you, you very keep much. Keep your brain active. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Thanks bye. also to everybody participating. Uh, it was really nice to see that we had over 60 people actively joining all the time, which is, which is nice. So, 
So just have a nice weekend, everybody. Stay safe and let's keep in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.